Kraft presents The Great Gilderslave. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Peary as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But if tomorrow's wash day and you homemakers are bound to be hurried getting lunch, let me give you a tip. Serve the folks macaroni and cheese. Do you say you haven't time to bake macaroni and cheese on wash day? Well, of course you don't, but haven't you heard of Kraft Dinner? With Kraft Dinner, you can make grand macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, you don't bake Kraft Dinner macaroni. You don't fuss with grating cheese, because each package of Kraft Dinner contains an envelope of Kraft grated, all ready to sprinkle in. With Kraft Dinner, you get fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness, and you cook it in seven minutes flat. See for yourself tomorrow. Ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's been long noted for his easygoing disposition. In fact, his disposition was so easygoing, it finally went. Uncle Mort's face has been getting longer and his temper shorter, and he's starting to throw his weight around with unpleasant results everywhere it's landed. My goodness, Marjorie, I'm late to the office again. Oh, good morning, Uncle Morris. Hey, good morning. All right, I'm, am I supposed to starve around here? Where's breakfast? Bertie, breakfast. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, what did you start off with? Grapefruit, cantaloupe, strawberries, orange juice. What's the trouble? Don't the stores still sell prunes? Oh, I thought you were sick and tired of prunes. Whatever gave you that idea? Oh, yesterday morning you flung yourself out of the house saying you're fed up, and I asked Leroy what the trouble was, and he says you're full of prunes. Oh, <laughs> Excuse me, folks. I gotta hurry to school. Yeah, come back here, young man. School doesn't begin again till next September. Just my luck. Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> now, Uncle, why don't you sit down and eat the nice egg Bertie's fried for you? That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Bertie, what is this? A fried egg or the stopper out of the kitchen sink? It's an egg, Mr. Gillsleeve, and it was cooked. Bertie. It wasn't cooked, Bertie. It was vulcanized. <laughs> I give up. Just wrap it up, and on my way downtown, I'll drop it on a scrap rubber pile. <laughs> By George, I'd like to slap a Jap in the map with this scrap. <laughs> and there's going to be a war in this house, unless I start getting fed properly around here. My, my, he's worse today than he was yesterday when he poured the coffee in his lap and then spilled the cream on his vest, thus dissolving the sugar in his pocket. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what's wrong with Uncle Lately. He's been as jumpy as a kangaroo on a pogo stick. Yes. Poor Uncle Moore. You mean poor us? We're the one he's doing his jumping on. You know, I think I have an idea what's troubling him. Gee, what is it, sis? Uncle Mort hasn't any love life. Oh, for corn's sake. Be serious, can't you, Marge? But I am serious. If he could only get excited about some woman, it might calm him down. Oh, you mean he ought to get unto himself a wife? What does he want a wife for? He's got Marge to sew on his buttons and you to cook for him and Judge Hooker to fight with. What more could a guy want? <laughs> I don't necessarily mean a wife, Leroy, but some attractive woman he could get interested in. Then he wouldn't have time to be irritable or critical. At least we could experiment. Okay. But who will we get to turn on the glamour? Well, how about Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell? Nope. Her face has had too many retreads. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you say to Miss Rosita Callahan? No, oh, she's got a pen like a rabbit. Now, wait a minute, brother. Who's going to fall in love with this girl, you or Uncle Mort? Well, gee, I was just giving you a man's viewpoint. Well, who would you pick up? What about Amelia Hooker? Judge Hooker's sister? Sure. She's awfully nice and jolly, and she makes the swellest cakes and candy. Yes. She's a high school teacher. Is that so? What does she teach? Oh, she teaches girls domestic silence. <laughs> Gee, this will be a cinch. I don't know about that. You can't make a silk purse in a pig's eye. <laughs> now, building up a romance for your Uncle Martin ain't going to be no picnic. Picnic? That's it? 
We'll have a picnic on Sunday and invite Judge Hooker and his sister. Uh-huh. Now make some of my famous potato salad. That ought to bring Judge Hooker. And I'll ask Amelia to bake one of her luscious cakes. That should bring Uncle. Yeah, and it'll probably bring all the ants, too. <laughs> No, Marjorie, this is Sunday, the day I rest my feet. I refuse to go on your picnic. But why not, Uncle Mort? Well, you've heard about nature lovers, haven't you? Of course. Well, I'm a nature hater. <laughs> Rocks, skunks, snakes, bees, swamps, mosquitoes. You can take all of them and give them back to the Boy Scouts and tell them to give them back to the Indians. Oh, but Uncle Mort, think of all the fun we'll have at Underwood Falls. It, what fun? Grinding the rubber off our tires? No, we're saving rubber. We're taking the excursion train. We? It, who all's going on this pickle and potato salad promenade? <laughs> well, there's Leroy and me and Judge Hooker and his sister. Judge Hooker, yeah. Uh, is Amelia Hooker going to? Mm-hmm. And she's baked the most delicious devil food cake. For you, incidentally. For me? But why devil's food? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's because she thinks you're such a handsome devil. Yeah, uh, handsome devil, yeah. Uh, who, me? Oh. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, that's the first time you've laughed in a week. Huh? Now, come on along. You'll have fun. Marjorie, I told you how I feel about picnics. No. Well, strange, I mean, you thought you were an outdoor man. She said that you remind her of... <laughs> Gary Cooper. <laughs> What's so funny about that? Amelia's entitled to her opinion. <laughs> Gary Cooper, eh? Gosh, I don't know what to say. It, hmm. Gary Cooper, huh? Well, I don't know. Oh, why don't you join us, Uncle? We're leaving on the 10 o'clock. Gary Cooper, huh? It, excuse me, partner. Would you mind stepping away from that there mirror? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I see what she means by Gary Cooper. Amelia was talking about the wide open spaces. <laughs> This beautiful. Mighty pretty country hereabouts, ma'am. The air is so fine and clear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You just say the word, Miss Amelia, and I'll climb that var tree and bring you down some eagle eggs. Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, then, can I fetch you some more uh, tater salad? Oh, no, not another thing, Mr. Gildersleeve. No, Miss Amelia, no need to be formal. Just call me Throckmorton. Well, all right, Throckmorton. Sounds mighty like music hearing you say it, ma'am. Uh, mind if I sit alongside you here? Uh, no. Oh, but... that's all right. Don't move. <coughs> you... Excuse me, Miss Amelia, but where boss did you put that devil's food cake? Well, I put it right where you... Never mind. Marjorie, have you got a nice wet cloth? Oh, Throckmorton, what a shame. Yeah, that was a darn good cake. Why can't you be more careful where you put your circumference, you big, you big pudding punch? Now, Horace Hooker, stop insulting Throckmorton. Oh, I don't mind. Come, Miss Amelia, let's wander down to the pond and look at the water lilies. Be careful, Amelia. Don't let the big bullfrog sit on the lily pad. <laughs> Why, that little uh, uh, joker... <laughs> Oh, look, aren't they pretty? Would you like some? I'll wait out and get them for you. Oh, no, Throckmorton, you'll get your shoes wet. Oh, no, I won't. I'll just take them off and my socks and roll up my trousers. Now, be careful, Uncle Lord. Yeah, don't worry. Ooh, the water's cold, isn't it? <laughs> no, Daniel Boone, it's just your feet that are cold. I'll show you, Hooker. In just a second, Amelia. I'll have your bouquet in just a little... Hey, Aunt, Aunt, where are you? I'll call. Come back up. Oh, Throckmorton, say something. Can't. Probably have a frog in his throat. <laughs> Look, it's, the Panama hat's come to the surface. It's drifting away. That's all right. He's probably weaving another one underwater. <laughs> oh, here he comes. Well, thank goodness. Oh. <laughs> Who put that hole there? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I've ruined all my cigars. 
Well, help him out, Horace. Look at the big flounder flounder. <laughs> Here, Gildy, take my hand. Yeah, thanks. Is it very wet in there? <laughs> oh, no, Judge. Come on in. The water's fine. Hey, let go. Woo! Telling me. <laughs> oh, now, boys, that's enough fun for one day. Come on out. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you. Sit down here, Uncle. Yeah? Well, one thing good. It's washed the cake icing off your trousers. <laughs> Gee, there must be an easier way of doing it than that. <laughs> here, Leroy, please dry off my watch. Okay, I'll wring it out. <laughs> oh, my goodness, give me a towel, someone. Why don't you just shake yourself, you little Airedale? <laughs> Look at me, I'm a mess. Yeah, you haven't changed a bit, Judge. Here's a watch, Unc. Cheapers, look at the time. Oh, it's almost time for our train. And the station's a mile away. Oh, gather up the picnic things, Leroy. Uh, where's your coat, Throckmorton? From coat? I hung it on a limb of a tree while we were playing baseball. Oh, yes, there it is. Well, I'll get it for you. Then we must hurry up. Oh. Uh, what's the matter, Amelia? Look, a bird. It's building a nest in your coat pocket. What's that? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, uh, look, everybody, a bird's building its nest in my coat pocket. Oh, uh, how sweet. Well, what a pity we have to dispossess her after all her work. Well, what are we supposed to be, the FHA? <laughs> Shoo her away and let's get going. Oh, Horace, you're too cruel. I am not. Well, what are you going to do, leave your coat here? Yes, why, George, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uncle, you'll catch cold. No, I won't, my dear. The memory of that little mother bird's gratitude will keep me warm. Gee, Aunt, that's the only bird in the country with a double-breasted bungalow. <laughs> All right, Sir Walter Galahad, come on or we miss the train. And help me with our stuff, Amelia. Yes, yes, coming, Horace. Uh, that was a very sweet gesture, Scott Morton. I, I like that very much. Now, now, Amelia, it's nothing that Gary Cooper wouldn't have done. Can you carry the big basket, Uncle? Yeah, sure. Keepers, Uncle, why are you leaving your coat here? Well, my boy, in the first place, has made a wonderful impression on Amelia. In the second place, the rest of the suit was ruined anyway. And in the third place, that bird that was building the nest was a woodpecker. And I never argue with woodpeckers in the first place. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, a suggestion about getting your food budget to balance. You're on the lookout for economical main dishes, I know. Well, let me point out the thrifty product called Kraft Dinner. For Kraft Dinner not only gives you grand macaroni and cheese in a jiffy, it's very economical, too. To make this delicious Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese, you simply cook the special Kraft Dinner macaroni in boiling water. You cook it not more than seven minutes and drain off the water. Add a little butter and milk. Then, with the Kraft grated that comes in every package, you sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through the fluffy macaroni. In as little time as it takes the coffee to perk, you have a grand money-saving main dish ready. Macaroni and cheese that the whole family will love. Many smart homemakers are never without Kraft Dinner on the pantry shelf. So tomorrow, why don't you get your pantry set for delicious macaroni and cheese that you make in seven minutes. Get several packages of Kraft Dinner. Love like mumps and measles hits awfully hard when it hits late in life, and Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve has it bad. For the past week, Uncle Mort has been wooing and wowing Amelia Hooker. It's reached the stage where he's writing poetry. Now we find the Summerfield Shelley reciting a sonnet written especially for the fair Amelia. If this were in the days of old, and I a knight so brave and bold, I'd storm your castle, Miss Amelia, and on my charger I would steal you. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? Oh, I'm dubitably, Mr. Gill, please. Yeah, thanks, Bertie. Or do you think she'd like this one better? <clears throat> it, two eyes of blue, cheeks soft as silk, a skin as white as grade A milk, a neck as graceful as a swan, a step as dainty as a fawn. The girl I mean is quite a looker. Her name is Miss Amelia Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Gill, please, it's hard to choose between the two of them. You sure is some versifier. 
It, you mean versifier? No, so fire on account of that hot poetry you write. <laughs> I bet you could get a job poetizing greeting cards. Oh, I suppose I could, but I don't want to lose my immature standing. <laughs> Incidentally, Bertie, don't mention a word about this to anybody, will you please? Oh, no, sir. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction, because I'm going to take Miss Amelia for a stroll through the park tonight and read her 15 or 20 of the poems I've written. Uh, there's going to be a wee fiddle moon. <laughs> Hello? Is anybody home? Uh, oh, there you are, Bertie. I just came over to borrow a pan to put under our sofa. On account of the fellow she's calling on me tonight is such a drip. Oof. Oh, come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. How's the big romance between you and Amelia coming along? What are you referring to, Dottie? Oh, I heard all about your big moment. It's all over town like a newspaper and I win. Where did you hear this rumor? Well, the operator at the beauty parlor told me, and she had it from one of her customers whose sister-in-law has a maid that worked next door to the judge's law clerk, and she got a straight out of her since Stars column in the afternoon paper. It what? Mm-hmm. It said, what big businessman, size 48 stub, is, is that way about the charming sister of a prominent jurist? It looks like a romance of April and November. Oh, uh, What are you thinking about, Throckmorton? Those crickets, Amelia. Listen to them. It's hard to believe that they can do that just by rubbing their hind legs together. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that what you were really thinking about? No, Amelia. I was thinking of your lips. Like twin petals of a dewy rose. They, they, uh... Amelia, there's something I must ask you. Yes. It, would you give me a... Yes. Would you... Uh, if you got a match, my cigar's gone out. <laughs> Really, Throckmorton, you shouldn't smoke so much. I know it, but when I look at you, my heart's on fire, and I just can't help smoking a little bit. <laughs> Incidentally, Amelia, I wrote a poem this afternoon. Would you like to hear it? Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. All right. It goes something like this. If this were in the days of old, and I a knight so brave and bold... Yes, sir. Uh, well, what do you want? Uh, excuse me, buddy, but have you got a dime? Uh, no. Beat it. Can't you see I'm busy? Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you were engaged. We're not engaged. We're just good friends. Go on, scram. But all I asked for was a dime. Uh, Amelia, do you happen to have change for a quarter? Oh, no. No, I don't want a dime. I, I want the dime. Uh, Throckmorton, I think the gentleman has a cold and is asking for the time. Yeah, that's it. Oh, excuse me. Let's see. It's in 942. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. 942, huh? That'd be dug up plenty of time. Mind if I sit here for a few minutes? It, no, you can have the whole bench. I'm a wet here anyway. Come on, Amelia. Let's stroll across the grass. I still think he's trying to borrow a dime. Oh, now, let's forget everything else. It's a grand night for a walk, and uh, you were starting to recite a poem. Oh, yes, but I had such bad luck with the last one, I think I'll try another verse. <clears throat> Since I met you, I've lost all care. I feel like I'm walking on the air. You're not walking on the air, mister. You're walking on the grass. It, so what? So I'm a park policeman, see, and it's against the law to trample on the turf, lounge on the lawn, or gamble on the green. Who's gambling? Oh, now, officer, it was purely unintentional. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, I didn't see you, girlie. Well, run along, and from now on, try to keep your father on the straight and narrow path. <laughs> oh, why, that flat-headed flat-foot. Why can't people let people own when people are trying to recite poetry to people? Oh, come on off the grass, Throckmorton, and do let me hear your poem. Yeah, all right, immediately. I'll try another one. Let me see. Oh, yes. It, two eyes are blue, cheeks soft as silk, a skin as white as grade A milk. Well, well, well. Fancy meeting you two in the park. I wonder if Shakespeare had to go through what I have to go through. <laughs> oh, good evening, Horace. Well, go on with your conversation, Gildy. Don't let me interrupt you. Oh, what's the use? If you'll excuse me, Amelia, I'll run along home now. Oh, but Throckmorton, I wanted to hear the rest of the, uh, you know. Uh, I know. I'm going to lock myself in my room and telephone it to you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Never felt better, my dear. Why are you making those painful noises? I'm practicing some singing exercises. Don't tell anybody, but tonight I'm going to serenade Honey Bun. Uh, I mean, Miss Hooker. Oh, you've certainly been in there pitching the woo, Uncle. Uh, pitching the what? The woo, stringing a line, making with a heartthrob. If, if you're referring to my tender passion for Miss Hooker, Marjorie, yes, 
I've been giving Cupid the jive. <laughs> How's everything going? Not so well. Last night I hit a snag. You did? Uh-huh. The snag's name was Judge Hooker. You didn't actually hit him, did you, Uncle Moore? If, if I didn't, then why is my mandolin all caved in? I smacked him right in the middle of his veranda. Oh, but, but why, Uncle Moore? Well, he made a big fuss just because I was strumming a few tunes to Amelia. Not that it was very late at night. Couldn't have been much later than three. <laughs> And he came barging out of the house in his nightgown, demanding that I hand over my mandolin. He kept yelling, give it to me, give it to me. So I finally did. You shouldn't have done that, Uncle. I know it. Now he's refused to let me visit his sister. Reminds you of Romeo and Juliet, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. But if the judge has forbidden you to see Amelia, how are you going to serenade her? Well, tonight's his lodge night. He belongs to the Summerfield's Nest of the International Order of Hood Owls. <laughs> In fact, he's the grand screech. <laughs> so he should be gone by 8 o'clock. Well, have you phoned to see if Amelia will be home tonight? No, every time I call up, Hooker answers the phone. I'm going to try it again right now. Maybe he's gone out somewhere. But suppose he hasn't. Oh, I've got a scheme. I'll disguise my voice so he won't recognize me. Uh-oh. Hello? Uh, hello. Uh, what number is this, please? Judge Hooker, President. Oh, George Hooker, President, huh? <laughs> no, this is Judge Horace Hooker. Oh, you Hooker Horsey, huh? No good. No, no, no. This is Judge Hooker. Now, who's this? You, George Hooker. See me, Sammy. No, no. Who are you? Oh, me know that long time. <laughs> What's your name and what do you want? Uh, me, Lily. Only Lily Hanlonly. No, thanks. We wash our own hands. <laughs> oh, for corn's sake. I said very smelly. What are you calling about? Missy Hooker. She home, huh? No, she isn't. Is there any message I can take? No, Judge. Just skip it. Gildersleeve! <laughs> now what are you going to do, Uncle Moore? I don't give up very easily, Marjorie. Remember, love laughs at locksmiths and jeers at jugheads like the judge. I'm going to send Amelia a box of candy with a message inside. I read that someplace. That should do the trick. Hey, Bertie! Were you calling me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yes, Bertie. Are you finished with the dishes yet? I've done the dunking, but the wiping is waiting. I want you to take a package over to Miss Amelia for me. Smuggle it in so her brother doesn't find it, see? Now, do you think you can act as Cupid's messenger in this case? Oh, certainly, Mr. Gillsleeve. I'm the Cupidest messenger in town. <laughs> hey, Judge, hurry. We'll be late for the meeting. I'm coming, Ralph. After all, they can't start until the grand speech arrives. No, oh, but if you're late, they're liable to elect a new one before you get there. Oh, they couldn't do that. Oh, no. If I remember correctly, that's how you were elected. Yeah, but the first thing I did was to change that rule. Yeah. Well, hop in. Wait a second. Someone's coming to the house, I think. Oh, hello, Birdie. Oh, uh, hello, Judge. What have you got there? Something for me? Uh, no, no, sir. Then no, it must sir. be for Miss Amelia. Yeah, that's it. It's for Miss Amelia. Fine. Just give it to me and I'll take it into her. But I've had strict instructions to put it right in my own hand. Well, she's upstairs and there's no use making her come down to answer the door. I'll take it. I don't know whether that's right for me to do it. Well, just give me one reason why not. Okay, I'll give you a reason, but I have to go home to get it. Fine. Now, just a second. There's no use you lugging that package all the way home and then back here again. Just leave it with me until you come back. All right, forget this. Thanks, Bertie. I'll take good care of it. That's mighty considerate of you, Judge. <laughs> hey, what's the idea? That's Gildersleeve's cook. I've forbidden him to see my sister, and dollars to donuts, this package is something he sent her. What are you doing? Foiling Big Gildersleeve. <laughs> well, 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 chocolates. Yeah. Have some, Ralph. Thanks. Oh, look, a note. Let me see. Listen to this. Dearest darling Moonflower, I've phoned and called to see you all day long. Ah, but in vain. And who has so cruelly kept us apart? Your brother, the little tinker. <laughs> huh. Something's wrong with the S on his typewriter. <laughs> Tonight, when old sourpuss is playing hoot owl, I'll glide beneath your window and let the golden notes of song pour out of my throat. Your fluffums wuffums. <laughs> say, Judge, what are you going to do? First, we're going to finish eating this candy. Then I'm going to get Amelia out of the house on some pretext or other. Then you and I are going upstairs and fill every pot, pitcher, and bucket in the house with water. Why? Well, when fluffums wuffums pours the golden notes of song out of his throat, we're going to pour the water out of the window. <laughs> The 
if, for goodness sakes. Quiet, you musicians. This is supposed to be a serenade, not a stampede. Yeah, quiet, fellas. Yeah. Now, you boys hide in the bushes while I tiptoe up in the porch. You get it? And I'll let you know when I'm ready. Okay, Mr. Gildersleeve. Come on, boys. Yeah. Now, take it easy and be quiet, boys. Ah, oh, Amelia, light of my life, listen to my song of love. Oh, just a little love, a little kiss. Just an hour that holds a world of bliss. Eyes that tremble like the stars above. And the little world that says you A big idea. <laughs> it's me, Gildy. Yeah. I hope you're dripping wet, you great big drip. <laughs> Is that so? Well, you never touched me. I was here in the porch swing all the time. Yeah. yeah but you got the whole band. We're all doused. Yeah. Yeah. Amateurs and fellas right to make all that noise. Oh, by the way, Hooker, that's the policeman's band. What? <laughs> Fix yourself up pretty, Judge. You're about to have visitors. I don't care. <laughs> At least my sister never got to hear you. Oh, no? Who do you think this is sitting in the porch swing with me? Rudy Valley? Ladies and gentlemen, this has been our last broadcast before our summer vacation. Before we go, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the Kraft Cheese Company for a most pleasant year. Also, my deep thanks to our writer, Leonard Levinson, and to the members of the cast for their able assistance. Walter Tetley, who plays Leroy, my nephew, Loreen Tuttle, my niece, Marjorie, Lillian Randolph, who's Bertie, Earl Ross as Judge Hooker, Paula Winslow as Dottie Dobson, and William Randolph Mills, our musical director, and Cecil Underwood, our producer. I am proud to announce that during the eight weeks we'll be off the air, the United States government will take over our half hour to bring you the Victory Parade. Each of the top NBC shows is contributing one program to this series, so be sure to listen in. I hope you all have a pleasant summer, and now, good night. <laughs> program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again August 30th at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Right now, you American homemakers are more nutrition conscious than ever before. You know that wholesome, nourishing food will help make strong Americans. Yes, and you're finding out that the right foods aren't necessarily expensive. Certainly a good example of that is nutritious parquet margarine, the wholesome, delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is an economical source of important food value. Why, nourishing parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve, and every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yet, for all its goodness, it's thrifty, too. Now, once you've tasted parquet's delicate, appetizing flavor you'll agree it deserves a place on your table morning, noon, and night. 
So tomorrow, order a pound or two of delicious, nutritious parquet margarine. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank you.